right, everyone. So we are here. I'm Coach Amanda um, from Doc Wayne, and we're here with Anthony DiCicco from the famous DiCicco soccer family, um, who has had a professional career in soccer for the last 20 years, um, working to help the U.S. embrace the history of soccer and um, making sure that we are evolving as an industry. Um, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today, Anthony? Thanks so much for having me, Amanda. We're uh, we're doing okay up here. I mean, you know, one of the, one of the things that uh, you know that we have to be better at as adults in terms of modeling behavior is is telling everyone when we're not okay. And yeah. so, for a whole lot of reasons, I'm not okay, and I'm doing just fine. And that contradiction is is okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's definitely a big sentiment um, shared by Doc Wayne as well. Um, so what has your life been like right now during quarantine and COVID-19? Well, I think the first thing is it's, it's so much of it is dictated and structured by kind of where you are and the circumstances you find yourself in. So at the moment, um, I'm coaching, uh, with a youth club up in Park City, Utah. So we're up in the mountains. And so you get kind of both the benefits of that is we've got some space and trails and the ability to get outside. And, um, you know, that part of it is, is fantastic. And then the other side of it is it snowed for two days this weekend. So, you know, we deal with, with both. Um, but the, the, uh, the hardest part for me has been that I'm from the East coast. I grew up in Connecticut, uh, and I just haven't been able to, uh, be back. I, I wasn't able to get back for the holidays last year. So for me, it's been almost 10 months since I've been able to get back to the East Coast. So, you know, that creates a, a different set of challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of noticing and recognizing um, everybody's challenges for uh, this, that like, you know, we're each going to have some pros and cons during this time. So right. um, I'm glad that you're kind of highlighting that. Yeah, our, our, you know, our families here, I think, and, and soccer families that I've talked to all over the country are, uh, are learning to adapt and adjust, right, which is, which is a key skill that, that can be useful. But what, what happens is we've become so uh, structured and so rigid, particularly around youth sports and around our teams, that you know, in many ways we were ill prepared and there was a lot of resistance to what had to happen in order mm -hmm. for us to collectively come together and deal with, with this, uh, with this pandemic. And, you know, so, uh, part of that experience for me was finding that our young players, the kids that we work with were much more, uh, savvy about developing a new routine in the context of the, the limitations that we had than a lot of our families and our, our parents and the adults that, that, uh, you know, I talked to are for, yeah. for adults that return to normalcy kind of took, you know, the, the, the top, per, the top focus, right. Is how do we get back to where we are? And, you know, for, for my players, it really became a week by week, day by day, minute by minute process to do the best you can in the conditions you find yourself. So when you feel good, you know, build on that. And when you don't feel good, see if you can shift your behavior, shift your actions in order to, uh, you know, to find that space again. And, uh, you know, so we've, I don't think anybody's navigated it perfectly, but you know, fortunately, we've got some fantastic leadership with our club, and uh, you know, so we're we're doing it, and uh, we've been back on the fields for a couple of weeks now too with uh, COVID protocols. So we're learning some of those lessons uh, through this process as well. Absolutely. Um, so kind of on a greater scale, right? We have two very important shifts happening um, in the world. And part of that is the COVID-19 shift with quarantine and, you know, different um, regulations, right, that you spoke to a little bit earlier, as well as a bit of a national awakening um, towards the um, just treatment of the black community and how um, some people are kind of awakening to this as a revolution. And so from your perspective, how has the soccer community and coaching been impacted by these two, um, two shifts? Well, the, the full scale of that shift and that, you know, what, what will transpire as a result of this, um, we won't know for, 
for many years. Absolutely. Right? It's, it's going to take time for, for that to reveal itself. Um, and we've found that there are already dominoes being pushed over, largely the dominoes that have been, you know, impacted the uh, decision by U.S. soccer to stop running the development academy, for example, one of the, the preeminent leagues in the country. Um, was largely financial, right? Mm -hmm. Was were there there have been a lot of financial implications? We know that you know at the moment there are forty million Americans who are out of work. So you 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 have this this confluence of things that are happening, things that need to happen, and things that that will happen. Um, you know the the experience in all of them, I think, is is very unique and specific to individuals. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that I found being here in a small town in Utah is that the discomfort that is being experienced by us collectively as a nation around the Black Lives Matter movement uh, is not nearly as pervasive here mm -hmm. as it is. I used to live in, in Washington, D.C., and, you know, I've been part of some of these uh, moments in the past. And the 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 privilege of the you know of affluent communities upper middle class communities across the country is it they don't feel it on a daily basis mm -hmm. and a huge part of this challenge for us as adults as coaches um you know is to ensure that the messaging of our collective society which is what dealing with a pandemic is which is what dealing with you know, uh, violence and, and uh, police brutality against, uh, you know, the black community and, and people of color is, and then also a major economic global event is also a collective experience. And, and so, you know, the, the, the opportunity is that soccer is in itself a universal language, a unifying, uh, you know, mechanism that ties the whole world together and, and ties every corner of the country together. The, uh, the challenge to that and the challenge that soccer has faced for a very long time is the people who run soccer, the people who are typically decision makers in soccer have been very privileged, mm -hmm. have been in those bubbles. And for the first time we are now starting to see some discomfort from people who have historically been very comfortable, which is, what's required for us to change and, and become better in a moment like this. Yeah. And do you, I know this isn't new work for you that you've in the past been a really big supporter of the women's game and, um, you know, diversifying soccer to make sure that we are all getting better, right. That we're not remaining comfortable, that we are being pushed to be better and stronger, um, coaches, athletes, organizations. So what do you think the role in soccer, your role, um, is in, uh, trying to forward this movement? What are the next steps? Well, and I, this is a great question. It's a fantastic question because everybody has a role to play, right? I mean, this is, this is the message that I want, you know, the 11 year olds I work with to understand is that, that we've been talking about team, right? And everybody on the team has a role. Well, this is just a really, really big team. You know, our country is a big team. Our world is a, is a big team. So finding and embracing that role, I think for a lot of people is life is a lifelong process and a work. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat fortunate because for me, I've settled into a role that I'm very comfortable in and have been in for 10 years, which is about constantly pushing that limit of my comfort. And so instead of, you know, instead of me standing up and, uh, you know, and championing something, my role has largely been to assemble people and mentor them and guide them behind the scenes in order to empower them to utilize their voice, which in many cases is either closer to an issue or uh, better educated on an issue than, than, you know, than I am. And so, you know, the ability and the, the commitment to champion others and to celebrate what others bring to the table in their role 
has a has a ripple effect and it mm-hmm. activates more people because you know Doc Wayne coming to the table and talking about the importance of mental health and the role between you know mental health and sports and therapy and sports is is utilizing your platform to change lives which is ultimately the goal of all of this and you know the 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 power of soccer is known what i think is hard for me in this moment i think for some other people is soccer has long been sold and used as an escape mm. and you know nike put out a great ad last week that says just don't do it right the idea of don't look away don't mm. you know fall back into your privilege don't put yourself in a position in a position where you're not contributing as much as you possibly can so that we're not having the same conversation in another five years or another 10 years that we're having the next conversation because this won't be resolved now. But the Groundhog Day effect of getting to the same point, of pushing the boulder up to the top of the mountain and then really having nothing come of it, that's part of what leads to the exhaustion of... uh, you know, the marginalized communities we're talking about and and allies. And that's why maintaining momentum becomes such a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And I love kind of what you're saying about everybody has a role as a team. For us at Doc Wayne, we have and try to utilize um, that sports specific language as much as possible. So we're saying similar things to kids, adults, families that like we are a team and that everybody on that team has a role. And that's such a big message to be sending. And I'm a big believer in team versus family. You know, mm-hmm. I know a lot of corporations and a lot of businesses and a lot of organizations talk about family. And I think there are unique, there are some very, very unique examples where that may be true. But, you know, part of the, the nature of team is teams evolve and teams shift. And You know, one of the lessons that I hope gets extracted from this is that, you know, as we learn, we evolve. And so the role that you've taken on or the role that you've identified, you know, be the best you can be in that role until that role evolves, right? Or until the demand on you that that you evolve, you know, comes. So you may start off as a role player on a team. You may start off as an intern in an office. but in big moments leaders step forward and Mm -hmm. they do what they can and one of the things that that abby wambach talks about in her book is the important and this has been you know reiterated over and over again is the importance of leading from where you are of knowing that if you're you know a reserve or you're a bench player or you're not a superstar on your team doesn't mean that you can't have a substantial leadership role in you know, the team accomplishing its broader goals. Absolutely. And this like kind of broader message of evolving, right? Um, I've heard you in a previous interview say that some of your organizations, the idea is evolve or die, that like we need to kind of push forward and um, continuing to evolve to fit the um, environment around us and to support the people around us. And so do you have any ideas as to where U.S. soccer should be evolving next? Uh, I'm part of a group that put out a, uh, a an open letter to U.S. Soccer uh, on Monday afternoon, in which you know we're asking them to take uh, immediate steps as it relates to their handling of uh, issues surrounding Black Lives Matter and diversity. So, uh, Megan Rapino, who was one of the co-captains of of the uh, women's national team that won the World Cup last year, uh, was one of the first white uh, and one of the first female athletes to join Colin Kaepernick in kneeling during the, the anthem in, in a peaceful protest. And shortly after that, U.S. soccer implemented a policy uh, that would make that uh, punishable. And so uh, there is the first step, which is, you know, reconcile the past mistakes that we've made. That's a very superficial one. It's an easy one to fix. So we've asked them to do that. Uh, U.S. soccer previously has had a diversity and inclusion committee that, uh, that hasn't been organized for the past several years. And prior to that time was not nearly as effective as it could or needed to be. 
So we've asked them to, uh, to reinstate the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and we've asked them to fund it at a one-tenth of one percent, a comically low level, uh, but that would be about $131,000 that could be immediately put towards, uh, uh, towards some diversity initiatives. All of, all of that, I think, is very, very important and should happen you know, immediately. But what we're finding in U.S. soccer, in the NCAA, in the NFL, um, the NBA is pretty good. The NBA and WNBA have some very, very strong voices. Um, but also the country at large is there's a leadership void, right? Mm. There's, a, there's a massive leadership void. And, and it's become harder and harder for people to see themselves in unifying roles, right? We've become so committed to the side or to being right that ultimately the the evolution the the understanding that whether or not you agree or disagree with people you're still on the same team you're still in the same fight um it is one that that demands that we have these more challenging conversations and we've already started to see dramatic shifts in the past month of preconceived notions and, and ideals, right? The, the idea that, that we all come from certain biases based on our environment, our conditioning, our you know, lineage, our family trees, the way we're raised, who we're raised around, all of that is the programming that we're given, right? And you know, through therapeutic methods and, and mental skills training, we can unlearn that programming. We can shift the way the neurons in our brain, the neural pathways that actually send messages from our brain operate and reinforce ones that, uh, that, that bring us more empathy, that bring us, uh, you know, stronger uh, coping mechanisms to deal with some of these types of things. So, you know, it's, it's just a ridiculously complicated, you know, equation, formula that we find ourselves in, and, and one that if we actually do the work to untangle the ball of yarn of our programming, then we can put ourselves in a position where everyone is, is, is stronger, where everyone has, uh, you know, I don't, the word I use in sports is equality of opportunity everyone has the same opportunity to then make the decision about how hard they're going to train or how much they're going to mm-hmm. commit to their sport. Because one of the things we know is that life isn't fair and that, you know, there are all kinds of bumps and hurdles that are going to show up in your road and, you know, in your path. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that there aren't opportunities to, uh, you know, to explore sport to its maximum, you know, not only physical benefits, but emotional, social, and uh and mental benefits as well yeah and like trying to figure out how do we make those opportunities as equal as possible for everybody 100 amazing um i also love how you're speaking a little bit to not just i think everybody's focused on the work that has to be done and the work that we're doing um and kind of a little emphasis on what we all are gaining um at the end of this and i think that that's such an important aspect to this that like you know we are fighting for black lives and um that is something that is important to uplift in that community but that this community as a whole is going to grow from it and that um the competition as a whole and that the level of performance as a whole can really benefit from it um and so i really like that you're able to highlight that as well yeah i mean it's 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 fascinating to think that you know i work in sports right sports does not exist without the black community. It doesn't, you know, I I think it was Reebok was the company that put out the best statement of all the corporate statements. And they were saying our brand doesn't exist without all of these people who have contributed to it. And the, the, I think the, the challenge that so many white people, the first hurdle, right, is to be able to make a statement like that and understand that it in no way devalues the contributions of other, you know, ethnic groups in the, uh, you know, or, or um, demographics in terms of the 
contributions they've made. You know, basketball was invented in Springfield, Massachusetts by Dr. James Naismith. And then he took it to, uh, to Kansas, right? And, you know, it, it doesn't diminish James Naismith in any way to have Michael Jordan and LeBron James become, you know, among the, the best to ever play the game. So, you know, we have to, we've got to stop tripping over the same, you know, stumbling blocks that we've tripped over time and again. And I think if we can do that, um, you know, then you're hundred percent right. The opportunity for us to embrace the full potential, the full explosion of, you know, what the black community brings to America, you know, and what, what every, uh, you know, every group of, of marginalized individuals bring to America. You know, one of the things that, that I found living in DC was the power of the LGBTQ community because it, it, they had, there was a strength developed there that was absolutely required for them to exist. And now it's, it's a, you know, intertwined into the fabric of that city in a beautiful and uh, beneficial way for, for everybody. So, you know, we're, nobody's perfect. We're not perfect, but you know, we can constantly be working to towards that aim of, you know, being a more perfect union. Amazing. Um, I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with all of that. Um, so kind of shifting into what you said before about, um, building skills and resiliency, um, within soccer, where do specialized programs, um, you know, therapeutic programs such as Doc Wayne or positive youth development programs fit into the larger landscape of U.S. soccer and youth development, um, in your mind? Well, I, I think that we are just scratching the surface on the potential impact of, you know, a whole spectrum of programs. You've got, you know, groups like yourself who are, are working, you know, boots on the ground and, you know, with players and families on a, on a daily basis. And then we've got groups like I know the other chat that, that you guys are involved in today is with the Aspen Institute and the Aspen Institute, uh, you know, sport and, uh, you know, what is it? The Society for Sport, something like that. Um, Tom Ferry is the executive director, and I've been around it for, uh, for a number of years. And here you have a group that's actually taking a data-based approach in various communities and giving us greater awareness and greater tools to have some of these conversations. I think the area that you guys are working in specifically is probably the area in which we are the weakest as a sports nation in terms of preparing our young athletes uh, for the challenges of life, but empowering them and giving them the tools to navigate things like being cut, getting injured, um, you know, the loss of a family member, you know, these types of, of uh, traumas, which is what they are, uh, that present in all of our lives, you know, are not uh, ever really thought of in a proactive manner. We tend to be so reactive. This happened to so-and-so, so now we have to do this to try to, you know, throw a rope down and, and combat that, as opposed to layering in those emotional skills and, and mental skills that will give, you know, our young athlete the full capacity to to take this head on and to process and deal with it in real time because what tends to happen is they tend to take those emotions and just shove them down, right? The, the, what they've been told and the programming that goes generationally is, you know, men don't cry, right? You know, there's no crying in baseball, all these, mm -hmm. you know, these, these, um, you know, beliefs and, and what we're starting to see is that, that next generation of young American professionals, um, guys like Weston McKinney, uh, and um, I mean, on the women's side, there's, there's a whole number because the women face so many more of these issues throughout the process. Um, but what we end up seeing is that, that they're able to articulate their experience, their emotions, uh, their state of mind in a much more, um, 
self-aware way where they almost, it's almost an out of body experience, right? Where you're looking back at the life you're living and being able to articulate what that experience is like, you know, dealing with being a black person in America or dealing with being a, you know, a lesbian in professional sports or whatever it may be. But, but then sharing the authenticity of that experience with others and and now we're seeing how a generational shift takes place because as that's happening, they're also out there mentoring youth players. They're talking to schools. You know, they're traveling the world as part of the U.S. Uh, State Department Sports Diplomacy Program. They're doing all of these things to, to not only uh, live the representation that younger people need, but also to try to remove some of that stigma and some of that fear that surrounds coming to, to terms with, you know, whatever it is that you're tackling in, in life. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I think what you guys do is amazing work and I think we need a lot more of it. Um, and I think particularly the, uh, you know, the need to have experts interacting and the availability for experts to interact uh, with kids in, a, in a, an environment where they do feel safe, which is sports, which is, you know, uh, a major caveat to the efficacy of the program. Um, I think it's awesome. I think what you guys do is awesome. Love it. Absolutely. And, um, you know, just to respect time, I think uh, we have to kind of cut it a little bit short, but I do want to leave any space open for, do you have any last thoughts or comments um, just for the Dockwing community um, as a whole? No, I, I mean, I think, you know, the fact by virtue of them choosing to, to invest their time and listen to our conversation tells me that you're, you're doing it right. You're doing the right things to educate yourself and to put yourself in as, as strong a position as you can. And so, you know, keep doing it. You know, one of the things that, that we have to, to learn about, you know, child development and uh, tackling larger social issues is these are marathons that don't have an end. So, you know, it's great to be an ally. It's great to be educating yourself. It's great to be doing all these things, but pace yourself and make sure that you're not ignoring your own mental health in the journey for uh, other people to, you know, uh, be able to improve their mental health or their, um, you know, emotional well-being. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Anthony. This has been a really great conversation. I think a lot of um, ideas and information have flowed through. So hopefully people are listening, getting a bunch out of it. Um, just in case for those who are from, aren't familiar with our work, um, Doc Wayne is here to fuse sport and therapy to heal and strengthen the youth of Boston and Metro West. Um, during the pandemic currently, we are providing telehealth services to kids and families, um, adults included as well. Typically we are on the um, end of schools. We are doing group therapy in schools, which is lovely and wonderful. Um, sport-based group therapy that is teaching these skills that um, Mr. Chico was talking about earlier. So if you do need any mental health services, if anything um, is coming up for you during this pandemic, during this um, revolution that like we are asking you to please reach out to us, it's support at docwayne.org and you can find that on the um, Facebook uh, page as well. Um, if you're interested in supporting the work that Anthony's talking about, that we're talking about, um, please, please, please try to reach out. We're trying to reach as many kids throughout Boston as possible. You can visit us at docwayne.org or you can even just super super simple text the word donate to 205-570-7251 and that will help support a couple kids in your neighborhood um, whether you live in Boston or if you're just looking to support some of those students so um, thank you so much Anthony we really appreciate it and thank you guys all out there for listening um, this was episode nine of our kids in COVID webinar series and there will be more to follow thank you all so much bye bye thank everyone you.
Ooh.